Hey, hey, welcome back to the Tony Kennett cast here on 93 WIBC, 93.1 FM out of Indianapolis, up at the Daily Signal and the podcast stuff, you know, everywhere else. Well, if you're like me and uh, you had a childhood that involved getting home from school and turning on the TV while you waited for the good stuff to come on, you had to sit through some of the weird local court TV. Some of it was good. You had Judge Judy, which was always great to see her just backhand somebody. And then some of them were really weird and lame. And I don't know, some of my best memories from childhood that were, I don't know, repeating some of the great smackdowns from some of these judge shows. Maybe that was a um, maybe that was a bad sign that I was going to end up doing this kind of stuff for the rest of my life. But now Matt Walsh from The Daily Wire has got a new show, Judged, in which he takes the same kind of ridiculous cases down in Tennessee and absolutely humiliates everyone in the courtroom. And uh, it, it's not bad. Matt, how's it going? Hey, doing well. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. So the first question that I've got, because, you know, I know you, you're not much of a niceties kind of guy. Where on God's green earth is the powdered wig, dude? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, we had a lot of conversations about the powdered wig, and I, I sort of regret not going that route. I mean, if we have a season two, then that's always, that's something we could add in. But uh, I think we ultimately landed on like it was it was a step too far. We have the robe. We do. I have a quill pen. You have so a quill I was, pen? That, that, a quill pen. Yeah, we kind of that, that was our compromise. Uh, we landed on that. We do. You know, we're, we're not going to go all the way to the powder wood, but we'll do the quill pen. I was and, hoping uh, that also you know, the, the that your your platform as a judge would get higher with each episode. Until at the end, it's like the parody and every plaintiff is like staring up into heaven. I figured that, that would, you know. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you bring that up because there is a, um, I guess I can reveal that this is a, a little behind the scenes thing. That we, the, the original conception of the show, we actually had the, uh, the judge's bench uh, elevate into the air even farther when the cases started. <laughs> and I always loved that. We had so many conversations about the elevating bench thing, and I always loved it. I was a big proponent of it, but I was voted down. I guess we decided that it's just, you know, it's, it's like it, it, it just makes the whole thing a little bit too cartoonish. I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking of if it just slowly, like it rose so slowly, you really weren't able to see it just over the, the point of the case. It just kept rising. So like by the end of it, everyone's necks were craning upward just enough to have like one of the plaintiffs ask you, are, are you going up? <laughs> just think, I don't know. That's it, a good, I wish I had thought of that, that during the uh, brainstorming sessions for this, for this show. Cause that's a good, that's a good angle. We, we didn't originally it was just, we just, uh, as soon as I sat down, the, the bench went straight up. Um, but that's, maybe, maybe <laughs> like we'll adopt that loaded. strategy next time. So, okay. Honestly, why, why do a judge show? I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of snarky, dry, deadpan humor that, that you do, that a lot of guys do. There's always a different flavor to it. I mean, you're not like Norm McDonald, every like dry humor guys kind of got a different way of doing it. Why kind of channel that into doing, uh, like some kind of a remaster of these judge shows that we had in the nineties and the aughts? Um, well, you know, the first reason is that, is that, uh, my, my passion has always been judging people. I've always been told that I'm, that I'm a very judgmental person and, uh, I've never understood why that's an insult to begin with, you know, because we, we are supposed to exercise judgment. So the, mm -hmm. the, the fact that you exercise judgment's not really, I don't see that as a negative and we're able to channel that into a show that, that's, so that's what made it appealing to me. But also it's, um, look, it's, it's entertainment. We were, we were looking to do something that's fun. It's the most fun for me, but hopefully fun for the audience too. Um, and also, also just entertaining. And there's a, there's a little lesson embedded in each episode, of course, but it's not, you know, that's not the primary function of the show. It's also not, it's also not political in a, in a really, ex certainly not in any kind of explicit way. So the right. question that I've had watching the show is that, yeah, you have your little moral themes that, again, you know, the very first episode start off, hey, don't take people's stuff um, and give the, the themes progress as you go through the season. I guess that sticking you in a Barney suit and having you do just very simple children's moral lessons was was too much of a concern for Jeremy Boring or did you just not fit in the suit? Uh, we we hadn't thought about introducing the dinosaur sh suit to it, but I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily shoot it down. I mean, you, know, you talk like about like introducing a moral lesson. And I mean, let's be real today. The moral lessons in society are so lacking that you almost need a children's style show to talk down. I guess if I was thinking of, you know, based on your documentary, you know, what is a woman where you break down very simple truths? Um, at least they were simple to me as a biology teacher. It kind of seems hilarious that it has to be a judge show to communicate some of these in an entertaining way, because back in the day, 
These used to be communicated through Mr. Rogers walking out in sneakers or Barney the dinosaur waltzing out onto that weird playground set. I just think it's weird that a judge show has to be the way that you spell out some of these lessons to people. I've been really shocked by the comments that some of the plaintiffs in the cases have made. Yeah, and I think that, uh, I mean, look, it is it is primarily a show where the the objective is entertainment and we're not trying to uh, change the world with it necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's, and, and I think conservatives in general should, that, that's something we've talked about, of course, the Daily Wire quite a bit, but that's something conservatives, that's a game we should be trying to get into, uh, j- making quality entertainment that isn't always, um, doesn't always function as, you know, uh, political, uh, you know, a political sermon every single time. But, but there is, you know, as I said, there is a sort of a lesson in each one. And, and I have had that thought in some of these cases um, where at the end I, I have to deliver a, a little bit of wisdom to these poor, confused, <laughs> sad, souls. unfortunate souls, sad, unfortunate souls. And, and, but some of the stuff, it's like, it, it is really, really basic to your point. Um, but it is kind of shocking that you don't really hear some of this stuff anywhere else on, on uh on tv i mean but th- these are these are really basic moral lessons and these are people who have unfortunately very dysfunctional lives and that's that's I mean, th- that's how you end up in a court show to begin with that that used to be the flair of judge judy is that she would just be this no nonsense she would hear someone kind of make an excuse for a crime like someone would be accused of theft and they would say well yeah i did it but the person really deserved it And she would have to crack their heads together like coconuts because the other person would never just sit there and shut up and let her lecture them. They would always try to help. And I'm amazed how quickly that started to happen in in your show. And there used to just be this, like the audience was saying it out loud, almost like you're watching a horror movie. You're saying, you know, don't go in there or something like that. And you're watching this judge show. I at least remember as a kid and you would want to say you're stupid to the plaintiffs that were on the screen. And it was like a relief when Judge Judy would do it in a comical way. And I'm shocked that the most entertaining thing about the show is how much that hasn't changed. If if not, it's gotten worse in the cases that have been brought forward, like how oblivious some of the people are to some of these cases. I mean, that are brought for you. Are there any that stick out as just being like, how did this make it to camera in this courtroom set? Yeah, they all kind of do. I I guess um, one of my favorites is... It's, I think it was in the second episode that's that's out now. It was a um, uncle who enlisted his niece to go purchase marijuana for him because she had a, a medical marijuana card. And so his idea of being a good uncle was to have her go buy him weed. Uh, and then she smoked it all and gave it away to friends on the way home and came home empty handed. And so she he sued her to get his drug money back. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing. Again, if you, you have to be that level of dysfunctional to make it on a judge show to begin with. But I will say to your point about some of these cases you see on judge Judy, where, and and I've actually been surprised by how common of a theme this is on our own show, where you have, you know, someone who did something wrong, clearly wrong, like they stole from someone or they vandalized a car, they, you know, smashed windshields. We have a few cases like that. Right. And the person who did the wrong thing admits they did it, but they felt morally entitled to do it because they were wronged in some way by the other person. And very often, I think we had at least three cases like this where it's a uh, it's a woman who did something like this to a man. And but she said it's okay that she did it because the man cheated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's been interesting to see, like, how many crimes these women think that they're entitled to commit if uh, some sort of infidelity is allegedly committed against them. I remember the last couple of years that I taught, I was quite honestly depressed because I was teaching. I moved from teaching in a rural area where I taught junior hires. I moved to the inner city and I started teaching biology at this high school. And the numbers of things that I would deal with on a day-to-day basis in which kids thought that what they had done was against the rule. They acknowledged that they knew it explicitly. Like, yes, I know I have broken the rules and yet they did it anyway. And then they felt aggravated that they were getting as much blowback for breaking the rules that they were because they felt entitled to do it. And as though like the emotionalism, just the raw passion behind, I should get to do what I want and everyone else should honor me all the time, always, and step out of my way when I enter the room. There used to be a common idea of I did something that was wrong and that in and of itself was dishonorable and shameful. 
And now it's, well, yeah, I may have done something wrong, but was it justified or not? And there's nothing that can't be justified. Yeah, exactly. And we, in the show, we get a very, we get a very sort of distilled and cartoonish version of it, but uh, you're correct that this is, this is a, uh, a disease we find in the culture at large. And it's kind of, the, the, it's a very simple mentality, which is, well, I want, I want to do something and doing this thing will make me happy. Mm-hmm. And I, I have a right to be happy. And so therefore I should be able to do the thing. And that, that is, that's the mentality a lot of people have, and, and they're raised to have that mentality. Uh, it's kind of instilled in them by the education system, bad parenting, so on and so forth, all the, all the usual suspects. Right. Um, but what you find is that when someone has that mentality and, they, and, they, and they've grown up with it and they haven't grown past it, but rather it's because, it's you know, children feel that, think that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're, not, if you're not raised correctly, then it kind of, rather than growing out of that mentality, it metastasizes. And when you're talking to an adult who has that mentality that has metastasized, it, it's, it's actually, it's oddly difficult to persuade them otherwise. It's, it's oddly difficult to present any sort of case that they'll find compelling because no matter what, like for them, it's just very simple. I, I, if I want to do something, why should I do it? I want to do the thing. And you could say, well, because right. it hurts someone else. Well, well, why do I care about that? I mean, this is how I feel. And it's, it's, um, it's so deeply ingrained that it can be hard to... Uh, extricate from a person. So making entertainment off of that is, is it sounds like an easy prospect at first. And I mean, look, you know, neither you nor I are the first conservatives to waltz onto a political scene and mock an incredibly stupid idea. And uh, it's, it's a fine line, I think, or, or maybe it's not, maybe it's not a fine line at all. How do you decide what and when and like how far to go into mocking the bad idea? How do you keep it from going into the land of cringy, where you're just like smacking everyone every single minute, like that old movie scene where the person's smacking everyone across their yard and like a pool party? Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question, and and that's something we talked about a lot making the the, the show. I, I think there is a line. There's a line where if you cross it, you know, now it it's very very lowest common denominator and. You know, now you're fully in the realm of like Jerry Springer and that sort of thing. Um, oh yeah, that's a good example, right? And I, I don't. It, it's hard to articulate exactly where that line is. I'm not sure it can be articulated, right? But we 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 certainly had cases that were presented as as options, and we said, eh, that's yeah, that, that's a that's a little too far. Um, so it, I don't know. It's kind of a feel thing. You kind of feel it out as as you go, um, and I. Do think, and that kind of goes back to having a some sort of even if even if the the point is not a moral lesson necessarily, but at least that there's something we can pull out of this, um, some opportunity for some bit of actual truth to come out of it, then uh, it could be worthwhile. I think. I mean, I think so. We're on with a Matt Walsh talking about his new series, Judged. Uh, Again, just a callback to the great classic American courtroom shows uh, that is. I would argue are pretty entertaining. You can find those over at daily wire plus what this kind of brings me into. And I don't want to get too into like cultural commentary, but I was chatting with Bill Whittle uh, over at the daily wire in his, what we saw series. And he talked about the emperor's uh, new clothes and how this naked emperor being paraded through town. You know, everyone was told if you don't see the fabric, it's because you are stupid or because you were evil. And so everyone pretended to see the fabric. And it was this weird, hushed environment that's not unlike today. And when the child walks out into the street and laughs at the emperor because he's, you know, butt naked, that's when the spell kind of breaks. And that's how the story ends. And Bill Little suggested that that was the cure for kind of pushing back against these crazy ideas that all of us really know are crazy. Everyone innately does. And I noticed on the show that you do play to the audience a little bit. It's not like I'm Matt Walsh. And I mean, obviously, again, the macabre sense of I hate being here and I hate all of you people. That's just it's just funny. It's it's part of that on brand attitude. But there is you are calling the audience who's in the courtroom, as well as the audience who's watching to laugh at these shenanigans with you. And I think that's important because that's what disinfects all of the this oppressive junk that like, we're not allowed to talk about this. We're not allowed to laugh at how crazy some of this has gotten. I, am I just like making stuff up about like how you guys do the show or, or do you play to the audience? 
Uh, no, we, we certainly do. And I think, I think it's, a, it's an astute observation. Uh, and in general, uh, I totally agree that mockery is uh, a very important tool, you know, a very important cultural tool. I, I don't, a show like Judge, again, being, being that's primarily just sort of supposed to be entertainment, um, right. with not, yeah. not as much in the way of politics. I, I wouldn't even put it as a, a prime example of this, but generally speaking, um, this is a, it's a, it's an extremely effective tool, like in the overall culture war that the right should be using a lot more. Now there, there are effective and ineffective ways of using it. There's mockery that is witless and purely mean spirited and not, and therefore not funny. And so right. it's, it's, it, it, and, and therefore not going to be effective, but if you have some wit and it is funny, then, uh, then this can be one of the, one of the most effective tools that we have. And it's one that it's one that the left used to use uh, to great effect. Yeah. And now they still mock all the time, but they're not nearly as effective at it anymore, which I think leaves this kind of it's like the ball is is there in the court. Someone just got to go down and, and, and grab the ball and, and run with it. Now, you mentioned, you know, talking about the left and, you know, how they used to use comedy to great effect. And now it's just really awkward and weird uh, looking at the White House press dinner. Uh, someone asked if I had gone to that, and I said absolutely not. Um, and but there was, you know, using little bits of comedy now. It's so stale, weird, and it's just cringy. It's like ugh, I shudder when I watch some of the new SNL episodes. And you know, Seinfeld's talked about this a lot. How like the far left has ruined comedy. Dave Chappelle's talked about this as well in like slightly different ways. So how does the right begin to pick up the bar for comedy? And maybe not the right, just. People who aren't on the far left may be the best way of putting it. Because again, as you said, like comedy is not political. You know, the show that you're on this comedy isn't just political. How to average people. It's such a stupid question. I'm aggravated by it because like, we shouldn't have to ask, how do normal people pick up comedy and make it normal again? That's not a question that we should have to ask. And yeah. I'm, I'm struggling here in this interview to come up with, with these kind of questions to ask you this in a meaningful way. Because this shouldn't be some kind of political podcast interview. It's a funny show. Judge is a funny show. You guys should watch it. Like, there shouldn't be these stupid societal questions behind it. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be unprofessional, but it's just, it's ridiculous that we have to say, well, even Jerry Seinfeld and Dave Chappelle are coming out now after years and saying the far left ruined comedy. Yeah. Like, we yeah. all know this. So, I mean, you've got the comedy show. I mean, where do we go from here? Do we just keep making new shows until the tides turn? Well, I think uh, it's not going to be the only thing that makes the tide turns, but I, th I do think we need we need a lot more entries into the genre. We, you kind of learn you learn from the mistakes the left has made. Like why it's an interesting it is an interesting conversation because when you talk about comedy, what makes things funny? It's like most people you don't really you don't think about that. It's just it's you don't break it down like it's some right. kind of well. What does this policy look like here? It's it's, it's just right. funny or it's not. But 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 watching you know one side of the aisle here that that still owns the culture right watching as they just get out of the comedy game entirely it it, it does and, you, and observing that you're like well what 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 happened why why is this happening um you do you do reach some conclusions and so what what why can't they do comedy anymore why don't they do it? i mean there, there's the jerry seinfeld answer the dave Chappelle answer which is partially true that they uh, way, way too overly sensitive, politically correct, all of that stuff. Right. That obviously hurts them. Uh, but there are other things too. And I, I think, I think one is that they take them, they take everything way too seriously. Now uh, you, mm -hmm. you can't do any sort of comedy effectively. If, ev if everything is a sacred cow, like if you take everything too seriously, especially if you take yourself too seriously. Um, and then also, and I think it was, Maybe this was uh, Norm Macdonald. Some, someone pointed out, I don't know who, I can't remember who, but that one of the reasons why even things like, you know, the left doing um, uh, it, it, you know, it, impressions, imitations, like it, SNL just in the last couple of years finally found a Donald Trump impersonator who's good, which is, right. which is kind of incredible because there's a million of, there's like a million people out there that could do a good Donald Trump impression. And for the first six or seven years that he was on the political scene, SNL didn't have a good one. Uh, yeah. And why is that? It's because in order to satirize someone, to do an impression of them, you can't absolutely despise everything about them. There has to be like mm -hmm. a certain amount of 
if not affection, at least some kind of understanding of that yeah. person. An understanding of like how the character works, why right. to create lines, you have to know where they're coming from. Exactly. You have to know where they're coming from. You have to understand them. And, and that's, how, that's how, you know, not to get hung up on the Donald Trump impression thing, but I think it's just, it's a microcosm that the really no, good, good example. Yeah, the really good Donald Trump impressions, are, you can tell the person doing it, even if they're left wing politically, they do have some affection for him. Uh, they kind of like something about him and they're, they, they, they enjoy doing the impression and that kind of exuberance comes through. It's what makes the impression really funny. Um, and then you compare that to like, what was it? The, the Alec Baldwin years on SNL of him doing the Donald Trump impression. It was just like he, he could, his, his hatred for Trump just oozed through. And his, his voice made, quivered. It was very, it right. didn't match at all. It was like the uncanny valley in reverse. And it was, and it, and it, it was so hateful that it was just kind of awkward to watch. It wasn't funny anymore. And, um, and so I think, I think that's a big part of it that on the left at this point, they, they hate their ideological opponents with such passion that they cannot make any jokes about them that go beyond like pointing at them and calling them evil. And that's just not funny. Like say whatever else you want about that. It's just not a funny, it's not funny. So if we, if you take comedy and you start actually putting it in, you know, a solid way again, I'd say that's only kind of fixing half of the issue for entertainment because some of the other junk that we're dealing with day by day is that it, I don't know, it feels like a couple of decades ago, like the lawsuits and the cases that were out there felt more cut and dried. And now it feels like we've reached a new age where everything, every issue, every lawsuit is extremely convoluted. Like you don't even get a case where a judge looks at this and goes, yeah, this is crap, guilty, $5,000 or, or, you know, whatever. It's that there's this one clause and this one thing that makes one individual lean this way or the other. And um, since you've started hearing these cases, do you feel as though your ability to, to, to rule on this stuff in the, in the show, that it's been easier for you to just slap the gavel and go guilty? Or do you feel like everything has become more convoluted? I don't know. Because you've always been so good at just clear-cut case. This is crap. This is not. Has the show diminished this? I mean, are you... Because I've watched some of the other court shows in preparation for this interview. And some of these cases are like, there's nothing interesting about it. Because the judges, they're on live TV reading subsection C of Article 4 in some random law. And it's like, this isn't interesting at all. It's like C-SPAN. Yeah, well, it's, this is where I might benefit from the fact that uh, I have no legal expertise <laughs> whatsoever. So I'm not I'm not bogged down by, you know, actually knowing the law. Um, so it actually is simple for <laughs> for me. And that's part of the point of the show is that, look, I mean. In most cases in life, you know, the the, the basic right and wrong is pretty obvious now. And in, in, in the show, it, it's like we get a lot of really dumb, silly cases, but. Uh, and there are plenty of cases where both sides are very stupid and have done incredibly dumb things. Right. But the basic question of what is right and wrong here is pretty obvious. Now, what things get more convoluted, I think, on the show or just in life when you're trying to get into assigning like a degree of moral culpability to an individual. OK, that's when it gets a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. But um, the basic question of what is right and wrong, was this the right thing to do or was it not? I think most of the time, most of the time is pretty clear whether you're doing a judge show or you're just operating in, in everyday life. Um, and there are exceptions to that, but, but, you know, I, I think you're right that we've gotten so used to not just in court, but in life, like um, every conversation about everything gets bogged down in a million tangential, often irrelevant details. And um, it just seems like there's always this effort to stop people from arriving at any solid conclusion about about anything really i mean it just feels like everything's in the weeds and i i'd even you know just to, as a bit of self-deprecation i'd feel that way at the beginning start off the interview welcome you on and then start asking you very like detail weedy podcast like questions i mean that that aren't interesting i mean you know i've liked your answers and it but to actually get to a point where it's actually some kind of a conversation question and answer on general things that people are thinking and feeling I, I don't know. It just feels as though this in the weeds convoluted to get us from actually reaching to the end point has been such a 
detrimental factor of like the last decade, I know since 2016, everything has just been hyper analysis and it's just, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. That's also, there's a, there's a real strategy there. I always talk about this with, um, for example, the, the gender ideology debate, mm -hmm. uh, which is not really even a debate because the answers and the truth is so clear. Right. But that's a good example where you have one side te team sanity who just very, very clear, like men are men, women are, are women. Very obvious. Don't 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 abuse children. Don't chemically castrate children. You know, very, very basic. Like this is the truth. And then you have the, the other side, the other side. They're not. They're not really engaging on any of those arguments. They don't they don't really have a a, a distinct point of view that they're putting forward. Most of the time, all they do is just try to make everything as complicated as they can. Uh, they, they do, they try, you know, you're, you're walking on the clear path and then there are the weeds over here and they just want to, they want to lead you into the weeds, not to bring you back on some other path that they prefer, but just to bring you to, to the weeds. To bog you down and stop you Right, to leave moving. you, they want to leave you in the weeds, yeah. like leave you wandering and not knowing where the correct path is. That's a good point. Um, and that's, and that's a, a lot of that is the, on the left, the, the breaking down of definitions yeah. And why you get hung up on every exception. Well, what if the, you know, in the, the abortion argument, what if she's a one legged Im illegal immigrant woman who has cancer and right. they create like the unicorn exception person? Right. And that's not, it, it makes a lot of sense. That's the, uh, that's the sort of internetization of, of political debate, because that's, that's one of the things that frustrates me the most about having any kind of debate on the internet is that anytime you try to make any kind of general statement or a statement of general principle, you, you always end up in your comment section with 10,000 people saying, well, that's not, that doesn't apply to me because uh, here's my Glasses situation. Down to the end of the nose and the book comes out and right. yeah. Right. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. So I don't have a solution to all of this, but you know what? That's fine. You should go watch Judged right now. It's on Daily Wire Plus. It's a good show. It's funny. Watch it with your wife. And if you don't have a wife, be the kind of man who gets a wife and go watch it. It's a good show. I like it. That's it. Uh, what is a woman's fantastic? I've already talked about that as a biology teacher. Matt Walsh, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for getting through maybe a little unorthodox of an interview, but uh, I, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Appreciate it.